Thank you. So I'm just going to say a, a few words generally about the Fisher Memorial Trust uh, and then to introduce the speaker. Uh, the Fisher Memorial Trust, of which I've been chairman for rather a long time, was set up after he died in order to, as it quoting, I'm quoting, promote the interest in the life and work of the great statistician, evolutionary biologist, and geneticist, Sir Ronald Amos Fisher, 1889 to 1962, and to maintain his scientific legacy by encouraging discussion of the scientific fields in which he was active. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways, the main one of which is to organize, on average, about every year, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little less, uh, a Fisher Memorial Lecture. And we often like to do that in association with a meeting. Sometimes it's a meeting that's of a society that's going on anyway. Uh, we've had it with the Population Genetics Group. And sometimes, as in this, on this occasion, because of celebrating the centenary of Fisher's famous paper, uh, we've done it in association with this meeting, which, as you've heard, uh, has had support from a variety of organizations and notably stimulated and, and, and developed uh, by, by Brian Charlesworth. I, I'd just like to say a few more comments. I, I think, Brian, you mentioned at the beginning uh, the history of, of, of that paper uh, and that it was actually, as Fisher told me, rejected by Pearson and Bunnett, Punnett, both of whom I later succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had a, a notable past history of, of um, uh, Fisher Memorial Lectures. The first one was Frank Yates. But I, I would like to mention Kenneth Mather, who I think was the fourth, because Kenneth Mather, Mather and Jinx, uh, formulated this notion of polygenic inheritance in the sense that there were things called polygenes which were different from any other classic category of genes, and there were somehow elements in heterochromatin, nobody knew at that time what they were talking about, and were totally unable to be distinguished in any way whatsoever. Um, and I think to some extent we're moving into a direction that fits that a little bit, except they just happen to be variants of very small effect that can be in almost any gene, but perhaps not as far as saying that. They're omnigenetic. I should say that Mather was my PhD examiner, and I once had great difficulty at a committee meeting when Jinx was present, convincing him that it might be possible, as I believe we've been able to do with face genetics, sometimes to identify individual variants that did have a measurable effect, what we could understand functionally, on a quantitative trait. And it was actually John Thoday who gave me my first proper job uh, who wrote a paper called The Location of Polygenes, where he used Bristle number into software to show how you could use linkage to identify genes of in individual uh, effect. Well, uh, I'd just uh, like to say now and introduce our, our Fisher Memorial Lecture. I think it's very hard to think of someone who's more appropriate uh, for this occasion than, than, than Mike Goddard. He, by using uh, the knowledge that comes from the use of a lot of genetic polymorphisms and the notion of breeding value, has introduced this notion of genomic selection, which is really quite a revolution, uh, which he's going to talk about. And it's something that is feeding into, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, the notion of applications in the human situation of polygenic risk scores, which has become uh, a, a very uh, notable uh, issue just recently, and in fact, if you read today's uh, um, edition of The Scotsman, you'll see on the front top right-hand part of it about how this is going to solve all the problems of dealing with heart disease because of a major study uh, on coronary heart disease in which you can calculate a polygenic risk score for whether you're going to get heart disease and you're going to be told from the ages of when you can first understand it to exactly what you ought to do in order to stop that increased risk. It's not obvious that it shouldn't be everybody that is doing whatever you're going to tell them. Well, it's now my great pleasure to ask Michael Goddard to come and give this year's 37th Fish and Memorial Lecture on the Genetic Architecture of Complex Traits. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that very generous uh, in introduction. And it's a great honour to be asked to give this lecture. And for that, I thank uh, uh, the Chairman and the Charlesworths and the rest of the committee for, uh, for inviting me and organising this lovely meeting. Uh, so the first problem I've got is that they're not my slides. <laughs> Different version from what I'm used to. <laughs> yes. Ah, there, there. Okay. From the beginning. From the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish they wouldn't change these bits of software. <laughs> okay. So uh, y you all know about this story. Uh, prior to this 1918 paper. There was a, a conflict between uh, the biometricians who thought of uh, studying these uh, quantitative or complex traits in terms of the correlation between relatives and the Mendelians who thought that they should be studied by looking for genes that did whatever <coughs> phenotype it was you were looking at. And Fisher's paper uh, reconciled these two points of view by showing that if you had a number of genes plus environmental factors, you got both the observed uh, distribution of phenotypes and the, you could get the observed uh, correlations between relatives. Uh, if you push this model to the limit and, and have the so-called infinitesimal model, then uh, you get, uh, it's mathematically nice because you get multivariate normal distributions. But in fact, you don't need to do that in order to explain uh, the observed phenomenon, uh, a few genes will do. This way of looking at uh, quantitative traits has been a huge success. It's been the basis for our understanding of quantitative or complex traits ever since, and it's been the basis for practical improvement of livestock and crops. But we really knew very little about what were the genes that underlie these traits. Um, I have been accused by one of my unkind colleagues of being a geneticist who studied genetics without genes <laughs> because we never had any genes. The physiologists preferred a model with very few genes because then they could justify studying them. And quantitative geneticists like me preferred an infinite number because then we could deny the physiologists any money at all. <laughs> but the point was that the data couldn't distinguish between these different ideas of either very few, model, very few genes or, or an infinite number. And that was until about a decade ago when somebody invented SNP chips. These are ways of assaying thousands to millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms in essentially one assay. And that made it possible to do genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, and they work because you have such a dense sprinkling of SNPs across the genome that causal mutations for this trait, no matter where they're located, are likely to be in linkage disequilibrium with one of your SNPs on your chip. And so it generates an apparent effect of the, of the SNP on that trait. So what I'm going to do here is to try and say a bit about what we've learnt in the last decade as a result of having this uh, wonderful uh, data, first from SNP chips and then from sequencing available to us. And I'll cover four topics. The analysis of this data, a description of the genetics or the genetic architecture of uh, typical complex traits, uh, 
The evolution of them, how you explain what we see in terms of the usual evolutionary forces, and the application of this knowledge to agriculture and medicine. So the analysis of GWAR data, in the, particularly in human genetics but elsewhere, is usually done by single SNP regression. That is, if you've got a million SNPs, you do a million t-tests. You test the effect of one SNP at a time, possibly correcting out for, uh, for other factors at the same time, but it's essentially a one SNP at a time test. Uh, here's an example where uh, uh, Anik Berman and uh, others got data from a lot of different studies in cattle where they had measured uh, the height of the cattle or the stature. Uh, so they had uh, 58,000 cattle bulls, 58,000 progeny tested bulls in fact, and they discovered 163 independent uh, uh, SNPs that were significant at this genome-wide significant level of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. And they explained 13% uh, of the variance. That's still not a lot because the heritability of, uh, of height in cattle is probably about 50%. So these 163 lead variants uh, only explain 13 out of 50%. And this is uh, the way in which the results of such an analysis are commonly presented, a so-called Manhattan plot. Uh, this is the genome laid out this way, and this is minus log to the power 10 of the p-value. So plague one, uh, this particular SNP, is uh, significant at p less than 10 to the minus 100. <laughs> Ridiculous uh, uh, number. Uh, but in fact, there are lots of significant ones. This is the genome-wide significance level. There are lots of places that are above that. The alternative to single SNP regression is to fit all of the SNPs simultaneously. And to do this, you assume that they're drawn from some random distribution. This is the genomic prediction or genomic selection model introduced uh, by Maywiss and et al. 2001. One particular case of it is what I call Bayes R, and it assumes that the SNP effects come from a mixture of normal distributions. So uh, the effects B are normally distributed with a mean of naught and a variance of sigma squared K, and sigma squared K can be naught or 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 times the genetic variance. Of course, if the variance is naught, it means that the effects are naught. So this is a model which allows SNPs to have no effect, in other words, to drop out of the model. And these uh, variances could be described as very tiny QTLs, or quantitative trait loci, tiny QTLs, and small QTLs. There, there, there aren't any big ones in this range. Of course, you, you can put whatever values you like. There's no reason you have to choose these ones. So this is a, an example of the difference between the single SNP regression and Bayes R. This is a Manhattan plot, but it's only one chromosome, chromosome 5, and the trait is weaning weight in cattle. And the blue dots are the result, each blue dot is a SNP, and this is uh, the p-value, log p-value up this way. Uh, so this is the normal Manhattan plot, but just for one chromosome. There's obviously something here, this is plague one again, but are these other peaks separate QTLs, or are they just because all of these SNPs are in <coughs> linkage disequilibrium. In cattle at least, and in many species, you have long distance linkage disequilibrium due to small effective population size in recent generations. And so it becomes 
very difficult to know where the QTLs are, other than perhaps the most obvious one. The red dots are the solutions for these SNPs under the Bayes R model. They're not p-values, they're actual solutions, but I've just scaled them so they'll fit on the same graph. And now it's much more clear cut. The plague one is still there, but there's clearly one here and one there and one over there. So you get much more uh, clear cut answers by fitting all of the SNPs at once. Uh, Here's another example. It's chromosome 5 again, just for, for I like chromosome 5, and, but the trait is milk yield in dairy cattle. And here's the one snip at a time, single snip regression GWAR results. Again, there's clearly something here, but how many QTLs are there, which, which are just uh, reflections caused by linkage disequilibrium? Here's my favourite way of graphing the results. Graphed up the side now is the variance caused by uh, little bits, little segments of the chromosome, uh, 250 KB segments. And, and now it's beautifully clear. There's five traits. They're all milk production traits. But you can see exactly where there are QTLs of big enough size to be uh, significant, discernible with this data. So my feeling is that this is a much better way to do QTL mapping than single SNP regression, at least in species like cattle where you've got long distance linkage disequilibria. So a lot of the analysis that I'm going to show you is using uh, Bayes-R but some of it's also uh, single SNP regression. One of the nice things about Bayes-R is that you estimate the proportions of SNPs that fall into these different categories of your mixture. Here's some results from beef cattle. Two traits, food conversion efficiency and tenderness. I've left out the ones that uh, have no effect uh, because uh, they're not very interesting. There's lots of them. So these are the ones that explain 10 to the minus 4 times the genetic variance, etc. Ignore this category. Um, and you can see that most of the SNPs have very small effects. And in fact, even most of the variance is caused by these small effect SNPs. But there are some that explain 1%. And tenderness is less polygenic than uh, food conversion efficiency. There's uh, 36 of them that explain around 1% and less of them that are tiny little effects. To me that makes sense because food conversion efficiency is affected by almost every physiological process in the animal, whereas tenderness of the beef is, is probably you know, affected by a lot less things. Averaged over lots of traits, they're the results that we got. Uh, I don't want to argue that these are exactly correct because they're model dependent and they're dependent on the amount of data and exactly what sort of SNPs you've got. But as I'll show you in a minute, the error is likely to be that there are more little ones, not that there are more big ones. Here's a similar analysis of uh, Wellcome Trust disease data by Gerhard Moser et al. Um, and this is the variance caused by these tiny little ones. And this is the variance caused by somewhat bigger ones. And those of you familiar with the Wellcome Trust will recognize the traits like type 1 diabetes and schizophrenia. And for most of the traits, most of the variance is coming from these tiny little effects. But for type 1 diabetes and for rheumatoid arthritis, there's more coming from these bigger effects. And uh, someone who knows this better than I do will tell me that a proportion of that is coming from the uh, MHC. 
recently there have been even better studies done with more dense SNPs or imputed sequence and larger numbers of uh, people. A um, couple of recent papers finding not, not 4,000 SNPs, but 30,000 got into the model, or 50,000 in the case of this Robinson et al. paper doing a meta-analysis on, on human height. So I don't want to argue that any of these figures is exactly right, but obviously there are very large numbers of very small effects. Uh, you don't have to use Bayes R to get this result, though. You, you essentially get the same result with single SNP regression if you have large enough sample sizes, enough people or animals. Um, this Wood et al. paper, 697 SNPs explain 19% of the variance for human height. So when you divide this by this, it's a very small number. And 10,000 explained 40% an even smaller number. Um, the individual SNPs explain somewhere between three thousandths down to less than 10 to the minus four. Uh, Yenko et al, again for human height, put together 700,000 people. This is incredible sample size to, when you think about uh, uh, our early careers where we thought if we had 10 animals in an experiment, that was a lot. Um, 700,000 found over 3,000 independent SNPs that still only explain half or less of the total genetic variance. How is this possible? How is it possible that there are so many tiny little effects on almost every trait we look at. I think it helps to think not of pathways of genes, but of networks of genes. So if you make a mutation here, the effect ripples out through the network until it affects almost every pathway in the, in the physiology of the animal or person. So by the time you get many steps out here, the effect is tiny, and it's a long way away from the original mutation. But, you know, because of all the feedback effects and, and effects of one gene on another and so on and so on, um, you see effects in a large number of traits, but they're tiny little effects because they're very distant from where the original mutation was affecting. Consequently, if you measure a phenotype close to the primary effect of the gene, then you tend to see bigger effects. So um, in, in dairy cattle, there's a mutation in a gene called DGAT, which is the, the gene for the enzyme that puts the third fatty acid on the glycerol backbone. And so, not surprisingly, it has a big effect on fat percentage in milk. It has small effects on almost everything that we look at because of these sort of consequential effects throughout the network. How can we describe then the difference between complex traits and less complex traits? This is Kath Kemper's uh, way of doing it. Uh, along here is the proportion of these windows of the genome, and up here is the cumulative amount of variance that they explain. And there's a number of different traits grouped into three groups just for convenience. So these traits, the first few uh, parts of the genome, the first uh, one thousandth of the genome already explains quite a lot of the variance. And then it just keeps going up slowly towards 100%. Whereas these traits, the first one thousandth of the genome doesn't explain very much, and you have to put in a lot of windows before you get up close to 
So to me, that's a, a useful way of, of thinking about the difference between traits that are more simple, where there's at least some genes of large effect, and traits, traits that are, you know, just look like uh, lots of tiny little effects. What about the allele frequency of these quantitative trait loci? This is from Yang et al. and, and for height and uh, body mass index in people. And these are allele frequency ranges, minor allele frequency. If the mutations affecting these traits were neutral, then you'd expect the same amount of variance in all of these uh, parts of the allele frequency range. What you see is that there's a slight increase when you go to rare um, uh, polymorphisms. And that's much more marked for height than it is for BMI. So there's a tendency for these uh, QTLs to be rare. But in fact, most of the variance is coming from quite common polymorphisms. So it's, it's not the case that most of the variance is coming from rare ones, but the rare ones are slightly overrepresented. How old are they? This is Kath Kemper's work again. Uh, she looked at a particular uh, QTL, this happens to be one for milk eel on chromosome 3, and she looked at the extended haplotype homozygosity surrounding both the ancestral allele and the derived or mutant allele. So for the ancestral allele, there's not much homozygosity around it at all, but there is for the mutant allele because after the original mutation, well, when the original mutation happens, of course, it's on a single genetic background. And recombination eats away at that over time, but there's still quite a bit left. And so you can estimate the age of this mutation from the amount of haplotype homozygosity surrounding it. Uh, here's four cases, some of them there's a lot of homozygosity and they're relatively new mutations. Some of them, there's very little and they must be old mutations. Uh, we estimated that uh, the age of these mutations was something like 1,800 to 50,000 generations. So they're not, they're not recent mutations, but they're not completely ancient ancient ones either. And when we did some simulations that I'll describe briefly later, um, if a mutation had an effect of 0.03 standard deviations, then it had an average lifespan of, of 25,000 generations. So we're talking about little effects that hang around for quite a long time, but not forever. And that's a reflection of the selection differential, selection coefficient. Uh, if these things were selected uh, hard, they wouldn't last very long. The fact that they last a, a long time, but not an infinitely long time, it, it indicates that there's weak selection operating against these mutations. Uh, this is just to illustrate the difference between what we see as sort of normal variation and mutations of large effect. In cattle, mutations at the myostatin gene cause double muscling. And under normal conditions, these would be very bad for you. There's lots of negative side effects of uh, um, having these double-muscled uh, phenotypes. So you only ever see them where foolish Belgium farmers have deliberately selected for them. Uh, and there's several different ones known, but the homozygosity surrounding them is megabases in size. So these are much more recent uh, uh, 
mutations, 10 to 50 generations uh, that they might have existed because the selection against them mo in most cases is, is quite strong and they get eliminated. Whereas the, the ones that cause most of the variation that we look at in normal populations have much smaller effects, much smaller selection against them. Okay, so the conclusion about the genetic architecture is that, in my view, all traits are complex. If you look at what's called a, a monogenic uh, or a simple trait, what you always find is that there's a bit of genetic variation in how severe the abnormality is or, or how dark the colour is or whatever uh, phenotype you're looking at. Some traits have genes of large effect segregating. They're usually rare, but occasionally there's a classic polymorphism. And the distorting effect of the scientific literature is that so much of it has been looking at these classic polymorphisms because, because it's possible to do it. No doubt they're interesting, but they're not typical. Okay, so how might this pattern of genetic architecture that I've described have evolved? In other words, what forces of mutation and selection and drift could generate the genetic architecture that we see? Well, we know a little bit about it from experiments uh, where they've estimated the amount of variance that mutation adds every generation as approximately a thousandth of the environmental variance. One of the things that that means is that these mutations that affect quantitative traits can't be neutral. They can't be, you know, uh, they can't have no effect on, uh, on fitness because if they were neutral, the genetic variance would just keep building up indefinitely in large populations. And that's not what we see. So the selection must broadly decrease the genetic variance. Selection, we don't need to postulate very much selection that maintains genetic variance, like overdominance. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but mostly we need to postulate selection which is eliminating genetic variance. And in, in the simulations I've done, I have stabilising selection and direct selection against the mutation where the selection coefficient is proportional to the effect on the trait squared. <laughs> so that little effects on the trait have very little effects on fitness. Is that reasonable? Well, ask yourself, if I was one millimetre taller how many more children would I have had? <laughs> because that's the size of effect we're talking about. We're talking about mutations that make you one millimetre taller or shorter. And I think it's reasonable to assume that they have very small effects on fitness. So I simulated this and compared the results from the simulation against the real results from the experiments I've described. And it leads to what I think are surprising conclusions. To get it to work, you have to assume that the target size for mutations affecting a trait like height is enormous. One to 12 or more million bases in the genome are such that if you mutate them, you have an effect upon the, the traits, say, human height. The other thing you have to assume is that although um, most of the mutations are negatively selected, selection tries to wipe them out again, there are a small proportion of favourable mutations. Otherwise, you can't get the range of effect size that we, we see in real life. And at first I was afraid to tell you this because you wouldn't believe me. But actually, if you think about it, it's obvious. We know of lots of cases like this. There's the lactase uh, example in, in humans. 
There's the DGAT example uh, I mentioned before in, uh, in dairy cattle or the double muscling genes in Belgian blue cattle. Most of the cases where we have a gene of reasonably large effect at intermediate allele frequencies, it's because the direction of selection has changed and an allele which would have once been unfavourable has become favourable. The, the pattern of mutation that I assumed is such that in the mutation variants, quite large effects explain a lot of the variation. So in the mutation spectrum, there's you know, reasonably large effect, but the selection just wipes them out. And so after selection, most of the variance is coming from very small effects. And that explains some of the mutation accumulation experiment results, where it looked like a, a lot of the variance was coming from medium to large effects. Here's a comparison for a couple of cattle traits and a couple of human traits. Uh, the number of sites that mutation affects and the proportion of mutations that are favourable in the simulation. Here's the simulation results and here's the real results. So I don't want to argue that these numbers are the right numbers, but something like them is the right numbers. These numbers are compatible with the uh, observed results. Uh, very large target size, a small proportion of favourable mutations. Now, again, to back up that this is not an unreasonable conclusion, other people using completely different methodology and experiments and data have reached somewhat similar uh, conclusions. There was a paper by Agarwala um, looking at type 2 diabetes in humans and again came to more or less the same conclusions. A very large target size, predominantly negative selection. Uh, Air Walker has a very elegant paper looking at uh, the the consequences for mutations uh, affecting quantitative traits. And the, the author and others describing the paper tend to say this shows that most of the variance will be caused by rare alleles. But in fact that's not true if you assume that the average selection coefficients are very small. Then you get more like what I've described. A slight abundance of rare alleles, but a lot of variance coming from uh, common alleles. So the key thing is that the effect sizes are small and the selection coefficients are even smaller. This, this rather extreme view of uh, the uh, genetic architecture and its evolution explains a number of things, I think. One of them is the long-term nature of the selection response. It's just astounding to me that the selection of meat chickens just goes on year after year making the same gains that it always did. It's just linear. How can that be when they've changed the bird so enormously? Why haven't they fixed all the good genes? The answer is there's thousands of genes and they've just moved the allele frequency of many of them up a bit so that it just keeps on slowly going. There's not a lot of fixation being driven by the selection. This model partly explains why the heritability doesn't increase with the effective population size. The, as effective population size goes up, NS goes up. 
And that means that the selection against the mutations becomes more effective. So the increase in genetic variance is not as fast as the increase in effective population size. It still predicts some increase in genetic variance. And I think the reason uh, why that doesn't happen in real life is what somebody alluded to earlier today, the, the effect of uh, linkage or within the, the chromosomes uh, causing variants not to go up as much as is expected. Uh, I think there are implications for population genetics most of the phenotypes that we actually care about, you know, uh, as opposed to just sort of looking for, for mutations in the DNA, but if you, if you want to study traits like uh, uh, size in animals or uh, clutch size in birds or something, most of those traits, the variation is due to very many, uh, very small effects with very weak selection coefficients, causing the minor allele to be at slightly lower allele frequencies than you would expect under a neutral model. In other words, this is a nearly neutral model. And so a lot of the selection doesn't leave a strong signature of selection. You can find signatures of selection, but you shouldn't expect to find them everywhere because the effects uh, are small and the allele frequency changes are small. Okay, what about the application of this? And the application I'm interested in is the prediction of genetic value or future phenotype, such as the pre prediction of disease risk in humans or the prediction of breeding values in animals and, and plants. Uh, most of the predictions use a very simple linear formula uh, where we take the, this is the estimated breeding value, the genotype at a particular locus, uh, scored for example as 0, 1 or 2 for the number of alleles that you've got of a particular allele, multiplied by the effect size, and then you just add that up over all of the, uh, the SNPs or whatever variance you've got. So th the problem then becomes, how do you estimate those effect sizes? One thing is to use the single SNP regression, and that leads to a, what's called a polygenic risk score. The alternative is to fit all the SNPs simultaneously in a genomic selection model, and then it depends on what uh, distribution of those SNP effects you assume. If you assume that the effects all come from a single normal distribution, then this is an example of uh, best linear unbiased prediction, or BLUP. The alternative is to assume that the effect sizes come from a distribution which may contain a whole bunch of zeros and which has a long tail. The advantage of this is that it allows for some SNPs to have no effect and it allows for some to have a big effect, whereas the BLUP assumes that every SNP has a tiny little effect. Here's uh, from Gerhard Moses paper again, uh, and these are the prediction accuracies. Well, they're area under curve. So 50% is random, and 100% would be perfect prediction. And they've comp he's compared uh, Bezar, um, uh, uh, um, another Bayesian method, BLUP, and polygenic risk score. And for some traits, there's really not much to choose between them, but for other traits, the two Bayesian methods do better than polygenic risk score and better than BLUP. So basically, the Bayesian methods either do as well as BLUP or better, and 
they generally do better than the polygenic risk score. Uh, this is a similar comparison, but in dairy cattle. Uh, these are for Bazar, these are for Blup. Sometimes Bazar does better, sometimes there's not much difference. I just point out this scale. These are traits that we're predicting, we're predicting the breeding value with an accuracy of about 0.7. That's pretty good when you think about it. You know? in, in humans, we virtually never see that, that high accuracy. And the reason is that in cattle, because of the long distance linkage disequilibria, we only have to predict the value of big chunks of chromosome. In humans, with the recent high effective population size, we have to predict the value of tiny little chunks and that's much harder because they've obviously got smaller effects than big chunks. Uh, that's sheep, just to remind you that there are other species in the world besides cattle and people and same thing, uh, Bazar does better or as well as uh, Blup. Why do we get these results? So this is just one little bit of chromosome 11 and the trait is milk yield. And these are the uh, BLUP solutions and these are the Bayes-R solutions. So BLUP gets little solutions everywhere. It does get a little peak at the right spot, um, but it gets little solutions everywhere. Whereas Bayes-R mainly gets solutions close to the QTL. And that means that Bayes-R is particularly an advantage over BLUP where there are some big effects to be found and where NE is large because then you need to be close to get the, the right answer. You can't uh, rely on this linkage disequilibria that exists for, for centimorgans in, say, in Holstein cattle. So to, to explain what happens here, uh, the BLUP says, oh, if I take 0.5 of this, minus 0.1 of that, plus 0.2 of this, minus 0.3 of something else, I can make up a great big linear formula that works all right. It works all right in Holsteins, it's hopeless in any other breed, but, you know, the, the computer's happy with that because that was all the data you gave it. Whereas this is more likely to be a robust solution across uh, different uh, breeds of cattle. So, conclusions. For the genetic architecture, all traits are complex, some of them have variants of large effects and some don't. The variants of large effect are usually at low frequency. But you need thousands of variants to explain the variation in a typical trait. How could such a thing evolve? It evolves because the, there are millions of base pairs in the genome where if you mutate that base pair, it affects a given trait. Generally, those mutations are selected against. They become... Uh, selection tries to wipe them out. The effects are small. The selection coefficients are even smaller. So the variants exist at moderate minor allele frequencies, and selection changes those frequencies relatively slowly over greater than 100 generations. And occasionally, there are mutations of, uh, of moderate effect that are positively selected, and we see them as being amongst the largest effects when we do these GWAs. Prediction of uh, breeding value or future phenotype. In order to get <laughs> 
accurate uh, predictions, you need large training populations. Now, um, the plant breeders will tell you that you can use only a, a hundred different lines of plants and it works. It, it may work for them, it doesn't work for me in uh, livestock, and it certainly doesn't work for humans. You need to have very large uh, um, training populations. As I've explained, the accuracy you can get also depends on the effective population size. Large effective population size means lower accuracy unless you go to even bigger training populations. The Bayesian methods are either as good or bl as BLUP or better, and the same applies to the polygenic risk score. The advantage of the Bayesian methods depends on the genetic architecture. If you have uh, some effects of, of large size there, then the, uh, the Bayesian methods do better because they find those large effects. If there are no large effects at all, then BLUP works all right. The method of analysis of the data, uh, I'm going to push my own barrow here and say that the Bayesian genomic selection methods where you, you fit all of the variants in the model instead of doing one at a time are better for everything. They describe the genetic variant, the genetic architecture better. They're better for mapping variants and they're better for prediction. It's, it's just that I can't conv convince the human geneticists that they're wrong. <laughs> and I'd like to thank my colleagues who did uh, most of the work that I've uh, actually reported here. Uh, and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you. Mike, there seems a sort of uh, contradiction between your love of your Bayesar um, genome scan plots, which have got a stonking strong peak and basically a flat baseline, and I think your correct analysis that there are very many genes having small effects. So if you like the noisier GWAS, single SNP regression means with the, all that noise there, actually un, if you, in some respects reflects the biology better than the Bayesar with the, that big peak. Um, yes, but perhaps you're right. Um, the way in which those uh, graphs work is that the little effects get shrunk more than the big effects. And so the big effects tend to stand out in the final plot. But, of course, if you're trying to identify a gene, that's what you want. You want the, you know, the, the slightly bigger effects to stand out. And and that's what that achieves. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, for a great talk. Um, I think what um, advertises against base R in a GWAS setting is that for a very long time we've been really fanatic about setting tight thresholds for GWAS. And I think that's something with um, base R where we're getting variances instead of Know, and distributions rather than hard test minus 10 log p values that we can plot and pull a, pull a line through. So I think that's what's kind of uh, holding it back in terms of selling itself to the GWAS community. Right. So um, I, I think that the uh, obsession with p values is completely misplaced. Um, <laughs> What Bayes-R does is that it reports the posterior probability that this SNP has an effect. And in my mind, that's exactly what you want to know. You want to know, given the data, what's the chance that this has a non-zero effect? Um, the, the, the tests for significance and the very stringent uh, 
significance level that is demanded <coughs> is, is perhaps appropriate if you're going to invest $10 million in tracking down this QTL because you, you just can't afford to be wrong. You, know, you can't afford to spend the $10 million on what was a, a mistake. But I'm not in that position. Most of us are not in that position. And the, the basis of that 5 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, significance level is that you have a 5% a chance of declaring something somewhere in the whole genome to be significant. You know, so it's, the null hypothesis is that there are no genes for this trait at all. Now, that doesn't seem like the null hypothesis that we want to start with. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm against p-values. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, your previous statement. Um, but could I just clarify something? So the, the Bayesian methods you're using, they're really, um, am I right that they're really empirical Bayesian methods? So you're, the prior distribution is, is being estimated from, from the distribution of effect sizes, or, or is there some, some genuine a priori dis distribution that's being specified as well? Um, so... Uh Daniel Gianola isn't here to correct me. I'm not sure how many real Bayesians there are. I'm, I'm never sure of the difference between <coughs> empirical Bayes and real Bayes. But I think this is a real Bayesian model because what I didn't explain is that we do have a prior on those mixing proportions. It's a Dirichlet distribution with one pseudo count in each category. So I, I think it's a fully Bayesian uh, model. Okay, thanks. Very nice talk, Mike. I'd just like to make one comment. Maybe the difference is not so much Bayes versus frequencies, but that you're using a finite mixture model. Whereas, as far as I understand, the BLUP model is basically a continuous expansion model, isn't it? Some sort of continuous mixture. Well, the so, just to, just to carry on from that, so the sort of um, penalization world that one thinks of is Lasso versus ridge regression and various other particular approaches which allow the possibility that effects are absolutely zero to come through, which I assume is what your method does. Yes. So, uh, you know, in, instead of... Uh, there's several ways to describe the same models. One is to think of them as being where the effect sizes are drawn from a distribution and the, you can get the equivalent answers by penalising uh, least squares. And what BLUP does is it says, I want you to make the sum of the squares of the effects as small as possible. And so, of course, as soon as you have to make the sum of the squares small, you keep all of the effects little. Where the, and, and all the other models, you know, have slightly different penalties. The, the Bayes R model turns out that it would rather have one of zero and one of two rather than two of one. Does that make, if I say that too fast? Yeah. You, right. yeah, well, it, the, the, the lasso is sort of in between. The, the lasso still doesn't allow big enough effects. Okay. Um, the the Bayesian model kind of puts all its money on a number of sites in the genome. And there must be cases where there are a whole bunch of variants which are equally good candidates. So, do you, I mean, do you have a sense from, say, simulation whether, okay, you know, it's, it's got to pick one of a bunch. Right. Um, does it get it right, or do you, does it sometimes pick it wrong? Um, so, there's there's two different sorts of outcome from these models. One is that you estimate those mixing proportions. But the second one is that you estimate the effect of each particular SNP. And that's averaged over many uh, cycles of the MCMC. And so what you find is that there's not 4,000 effects that are non-zero in the final solutions. There's much more. Because sometimes it picked this SNP and sometimes it picked that one. 
And so in the averages, they're, they're both there. So it, it does seem to do a reasonably good job. If, if it tells you that there's a 80% chance that this SNP has a non-zero effect, then it's probably true. It has an 80% chance. You know, it's, it's well calibrated in that sense. But quite often what it tells you is that there's a whole bunch of SNPs here, all with a 10% chance, because the LD is so strong that I can't determine which of them is, is the best one. So it doesn't give you any clear winner. But in my mind, that's actually a good thing, because it, it's telling you the data does not support a clear winner. I can't decide which of these ones is, is the best. I mean, uh, have you done simulations to see? Yes. Does it generally pick either either the right SNP or something in strong LD? As a generally, set? something in strong LD with the right one, depending on how <coughs> good you, you, the data is that you simulate. You know, you could simulate data which has got a lot of information content, and the analysis does a really good job. Or you can simulate data that's not very informative, and it gives you sort of blurred answers. But at least it doesn't tell you that it knows the answer when it doesn't. Maybe just a comment there, that perhaps the Bayesar works best because you've got this problem of extensive LD in your cattle, and so you're less likely to want to pick out one thing about that. So it might not work quite as well uh, in the human situation. Yeah, I think you're right, uh, but as I, as I showed, that it, even in humans, if you have a trait like um, type 1 diabetes, oh. you see an advantage of, of a method that will sort of pick out the big effects that are there. It's about only type 1 diabetes that does that, because it's so well defined and so much of it is HOA. Y yes, and, and rheumatoid arthritis too. And the same, mm. yeah. Any other? Yes. Uh, this is probably something I shouldn't say at a Fisher meeting, but it seems that your con con the field is converging on Sewell Wright's view of the evolution of quantitative traits, where there's universal pleiotropy in, and the change in a trait is driven by very small shifts in allele frequencies. Um, I'm just trying to stir up Walter here. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I, th I think that's right. You know, when if you've got 10,000 effects that affect a, a particular trait, then you can make a a big change in the mean by a small change in all of those allele frequencies. Now, if there happens to be a big effect there, then selection will drive it. There's no, you know, there's no doubt about that. And, and there are classic cases like uh, insecticide resistance in insects, for example. But for, for the main part, what you see is this small shift in all the allele frequencies uh, and you know it, it's hard to it's hard to perceive that just a comment on on Brian's comment uh, Fisher lived in a time when it was thought that the density of polymorphic variants was very low and in fact to such an extent that when I was working on effects of linkage disequilibrium he said well it probably wouldn't be relevant because there isn't enough density of variance if he'd known what we know now, I don't think he would have said the same thing. I was, I was not trying to disrespect Fisher. <laughs> but I think, I think thinking historically, it's quite important to bear that in mind. And in that respect, what he said in 2018 was quite remarkable. Yes. 1918. <laughs> 18, 1918, yes, sorry. And of course, the, uh, you know, the, the model that's emerging is... Um, pretty close to an infinitesimal model. It's, yeah. it's not infinitesimal. Uh, Michelle George called it a pseudo-infinitesimal model. But it, it's surprising when you look back just a few years when people, including me, <laughs> tried to estimate the number of uh, genes affecting a typical trait. We came up with numbers like 50 or 100. And we were out by two orders of magnitude. <laughs> 
Well, I think it's my great pleasure now, not only to thank you for that, but you do have some things that, uh, sorry, yes. You, you do have something that we have to give you in return for the wonderful lecture you gave. The first thing I'd like to give you is this traditional bowl. It's a silver bowl that most of the Fisher lectures have received from a distinguished uh, service. Uh, but it's not quite over, because we also have something material that you can buy something with unless you wanted to sell that. So it's a great pleasure again to thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honour to be asked to do it. Okay, I've just got a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there's going to be a reception uh, downstairs to which everybody is invited. That's announcement number one. Secondly, those of you who've got posters, could you please make sure you take your posters away by the end of the reception? Um, uh, and finally, those of you, the select few, this is, after all, a Calvinist society where there's the gods elect, uh, invited to the Fisher Memorial Dinner, um, this will take place in the 10 Hill Place Hotel restaurant. There have been some questions about this. So, so it, it's just a few minutes' walk uh, along the street and then left to Hill, 10 Hill Place. So everybody who's been invited to the restaurant knows who they are. There's just one other question. Is, is Richard Newsom here? Yes. Uh, that's, Richard, is, I believe, is Fisher's grandson. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so a round of applause for Richard. <laughs> Okay, uh, and, and that's all. Thank you very much, folks, for coming. It's been a terrific meeting, I think.